Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. I've got to tell you, we have a show today for you that is probably one of our greatest shows we have recorded yet to date. It is a fantastic episode. I cannot wait for you to meet this guest. But before we get to our guest, I want to introduce the host of our show, Ian Cron. Ian, I got to know, how are you feeling today? Well, I'm... Uh, how are you feeling right now? <laughs> well, we just finished this uh, interview with uh, Dr. Kirk Thompson. And I've known Kirk as a friend for about five years now. And uh, he's a, a psychiatrist in private practice. And he lives in Falls Church, Virginia. And there were moments in this conversation that left, I think, both of us speechless. Yes. I mean, brought us to silence. Mm -hmm. um, Kurt is a very deep person. He's the author of really two books. I didn't mention both in the show. The, the first one is The Anatomy of the Soul. Right. And the other one is called The Soul uh, of, uh, of Shame, Retelling the Stories We Believe About Ourselves. And, uh, man, we go to some places that were, were so deep and, and meaningful, talking about each type, uh, the experience that all of us as human beings have of, of shame. And Kurt was so intellectually smart and challenging but emotionally we went to some places that really surprised me deeply moved me and in a way this show transcends a conversation about the enneagram it does though we talk a lot about it in the show it, it evolved into a conversation about what the heck does it mean to be human i still feel it like in my body like I, like honestly we got off of the call and you and I just sat there and looked at each other in silence for probably 30 seconds. Yeah. There, there was nothing to say. I mean, it's that powerful. It is. And so I don't care who you are listening right now. If your tendency is, is just to listen halfway to a podcast, I'm begging you go all the way to the end on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, Please because do, yes. where it ends up in the end is just profoundly moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think we'll be changing real, really heart changing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. so super excited about this interview and uh before we get to the interview itself and get to kurt let's do a little bit of housekeeping uh we do want to let our listeners know that we are adding youtube we're adding video to our podcast so we'll be on all the platforms that you've normally heard us on apple and spotify and so forth but you can also watch the conversation now on youtube just go to Ian Morgan Cron, go to YouTube and then type in Ian Morgan Cron, you pop up and uh, it's right there. No worries. And please, if you would take some time to subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, we sure appreciate it. And then also we've got uh, a really great special going on now. You want to tell us uh, about the special on the IEQ9, Ian? Yeah. You know, people ask me all the time, how do I discover my type? And there's a lot of ways to do it. And one way to do it is by taking a high quality assessment. And the IEQ-9 that we have available on my website, ianmorgancron.com, uh, I think is the most um, accurate measure of personality type. And it, it really gives the most robust report of any assessment that I know of. And uh, for our typology uh, listeners, all they got to do is go to my website, right? Go mm -hmm. hit IQ9, and if they use the password typology, right, uh, they're going to get a 20% discount off That's the assessment. That's fantastic. That's great. So ianmorgancron.com right. forward slash assessment, or just go to ianmorgancron.com, type or uh, enter T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y, -O -O typology, and you get the 20% uh, off. That's right. And I think it's all uppercase letters. Yes. I believe so. Anyway, let's not waste any time. I, I'm dying for people to hear this episode with my friend, Dr. Kurt Thompson. Dr. Kurt Thompson, welcome to Typology. 
Ian Cron, it's great to be here. I'm just thrilled to eventually have the opportunity to hang out with you and talk. We've just had such a lovely time. So many times we've been together. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I uh, was telling someone earlier today that um, you're one of the kindest and uh, deepest people that I know. And so I'm uh, thrilled to have to share mm. you. You're like show mm. and tell on typology today. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, great. It's great to be back in first grade. Love that. <laughs> well, you, well, when you're with me, Kurt. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, no. okay. Strike that from the record. Okay. <laughs> hey, listen, so everybody knows um, Kurt wrote one of the most amazing books titled The Soul of Shame, Retelling the Stories We Believe About Ourselves. And I cannot commend it to you enough. It is a tremendous book uh, on a topic that really is, is perennial, right? Because when we, we talk about shame, um, we're talking about something so at the core of the human experience um, mm. that it, it's, it's hard to overstate um, how much a part of the human experience shame is. Now, this is a show about the Enneagram, and so uh, we're going to jump into a conversation about shame and uh, Enneagram types, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to go through all nine types, so it's, it's going to be something valuable for every single one of our folks who, uh, who listen to, the, to the, the podcast. But where I want to begin, Kurt, is by asking you about your Enneagram journey uh, and how uh, it's come to perhaps play a role in your, in your life, if it has. Well, I first heard about the Enneagram about, I'm guessing, probably 12, 13 years ago. Uh, in, uh, interestingly enough, in a conference that Dan Siegel, my friend, colleague, was leading, and first came up on my landscape and uh, took a cursory look at it at the time, did not delve into it that much at all. And then my first real exposure to it was, lo and behold, sitting in a day-long workshop with you in Florida. Right, right, right. Now right. back about three and a half years ago. And found uh, in that, uh, not I think not just in, in, in the information, but I also found, as you and I, as I've said to you before, I found in the way you were talking about it, made it... Um, um, accessible in a way that I found to be really useful and helpful, I think. Uh, and, and so since that time, uh, of course, it's become uh, much more, it's been a much more active tool that we've talked about with patients. I, I don't, I don't use it uh, a great, a great deal in, in that I'm not uh, filtering every patient's story through that lens. But patients come with questions about it, and we're finding it to be a really helpful uh, tool, a really helpful piece of machinery, if you will, kind of like psychological um, instruments to help people make sense of things. And I think that in many respects, uh, anytime we can find uh, metaphors, language, models, anything that helps our left brain kind of analyze and make sense of what our experience is, that integrative process uh, draws us closer to a place of wholeness, both within ourselves and with each other. And, uh, and so that's, that's how I found, you know, giving, it, it gives people a model, a, a metaphor, um, something they can hang their hat on to give them a better felt sense of understanding, which I think at the end of the day, practically speaking, if I have something that my mind can turn its attention to uh, long enough to say, when I'm in the middle of being tempted to pick up the carving knife in my kitchen when my adolescent daughter or son is doing whatever, uh, if I can first pause and say, oh, no, wait, this is my number, this is a darker side of my number four coming out, or the darker side of my number three or two or whatever coming out, it does give me a way of pausing, breathing, and reflecting differently mm -hmm. uh, that really enables me to change the course of the choices that I'm making in micro moments. And I think the other thing too, is that as people um, kind of with intention delve more deeply, try to reflect more intentionally and preemptively 
on not just their particular type, but on the types of others that they encounter around them. Uh, I think that it, it my, my experience of it is that it gives people a greater sense of capacity for non-reactivity, right? They have an experience with somebody that experience triggers, you might say, right, their lizard brain, right, their fight or flight mechanism. And instead of them just dumping into the darker side of whatever the number happens to be, they can pause, take a breath, and actually then move closer toward that person by, you know, with a posture of curiosity, um, mostly because they've got this, you know, this um, tool that is helping them do that. Yeah. I, I think it's a, a wonderful, um, the way I would say it is uh, spiritual technology uh, that that helps people uh, enter into conversation with themselves about their habitual ways of acting, thinking, and feeling, identifying those uh, be- patterns of behavior that are self-defeating or hurtful to others. And it may not be able to handle uh, some of the deeper uh, issues of, that go along with psychology, but as a starting instrument, you know, it is a great way of thinking uh, of about you know who we are, and what are we doing, and why are we doing it? You know, Abs- right, absolutely right. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really helpful. I, th- I think you know, in the course of the last fifteen or more years. Uh, doing this work at this interface of neuroscience and spiritual formation, I think one of the things that we find that, you know, help teaching people about the brain and its operations and so forth and so on, uh, one of the things that that does, as, as much as anything, it doesn't just make people smarter about neuroscience, as much as it also gives people a working understanding, gives them something to hang their hat on, some way of comprehending more effectively what's actually happening with them mechanically, Right, so the technology that you're talking about it provides a way of mechanically understanding what's taking place in our interactions, either within or between us, and that gives my brain, that gives my mind, an additional way of pausing before I simply act automatically out of those old, what we would call old implicit neural networks. And so, in that way, I think the Enneagram has been uh, just an invaluable help. To of many, many people. Yeah. So I, I know that I, you may have been the one who taught me this, but I, it's actually a, a, an interesting um, way of thinking about it. We, we've talked about the, were you the one who taught me about the, the fist and the limbic well, system? and the, Yeah, it's, it, it's actually Dan Siegel's uh, kind of creative right. uh, yeah. genius, but I, but I mean, 15 years ago when I first uh, ran into him, I mean, that's, that was the, wor- the work of it. And that's how we use this, the brain in the palm of your hand. Right. Right. So if this is our brain, mm-hmm. right. The thumb right. is the limbic system, right? This is the reptilian. Well, we actually, this, right? yeah, we actually say that like your, we start with your forearm, which is your spinal cord, and everything comes right. into your spinal cord, runs north to your wrist, which is your brain stem. That's, okay. your, right, that's your reptilian brain, your right. fight or flight. I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just either going to run or I'm going to punch in the nose. I'm going to do that. Hopefully not. Um, we open our hand and this, this thumb represents our limbic circuitry out of which is emerging all of our emotional activity and we curl our fingers over, and this outside portion represents our prefrontal cortex, especially the parts of your middle two fingers and the fingernails that are, interestingly enough, anatomically close to the limbic circuitry, your thumb, and close to, when you bend your wrist over, close to your wrist, because the job of the prefrontal cortex, the part right behind your eyes, its task, among other things, is to regulate my limbic circuitry and my brain stem, instead of just letting them grab the steering wheel and take the car wherever they want to. I think that part of uh, one, one of the, again, one of the helpful ways that the Enneagram operates is that it enables that prefrontal cortex to do a more effective job of regulating the, not shutting it off, not shut, not, not, not burying what I feel, but being curious about what I feel, being open to what I feel, regulating it, not controlling it, not pushing it out, that and my tendency that I want to flee or I want to fight you, what is that about? Being more curious about that. And so, again, the more tools we have in our box to help that prefrontal cortical activity, 
the more able it is to activate and regulate those two other forces in the brain. Yeah, and I love, I think, I think it's Dan Siegel who does this. He's in it, and so let's put it in Enneagram language, right? If it, if it gives us the ability to pause and reflect, it prevents us from, as he would say, right, flipping our lid. That's exactly right. Yeah, right? that's exactly right. And when your prefrontal cortex goes offline, right, and it, you flip your lid, and then what you're doing is allowing this part of your brain run the show, and this one can get you into a lot of trouble, right, in reactivity. It, it can, it, and it often does in, yeah. you know, in my kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> gets, me in, gets me in trouble in my kitchen. <laughs> Rarely is it my wife. It's usually me. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Let's get to shame because um, this has been, you know, your area of expertise. It's what people know about you from your writing um, and uh, about its, you know, influence. It's and how it governs our lives from the shadows. And I want to talk about shame and Enneagram types. But before we do, I want you just to tell our folks what shame is. Well, I think um, one of the most, you know, people say, well, what's the definition of shame? I think that it's uh, probably easier to describe what it does as opposed to what it is. And what it does, we tell folks the first thing to know about it at when we think about shame and we talk about it, we think we're talking about some kind of idea or some abstraction. There's this thing called shame that's out there in the universe. The first thing it's important for our listeners to know is that it is an embodied phenomenon. It's what we call a neurophysiologic response. It is my brain and my body working together, responding to something that I have sensed that is coming at me either from outside my skin or from inside my mind. So for instance, if you look at me a certain way or there's a certain tone of voice or a certain form of eye contact, it creates literally within me, it activates a response within me which, with which I want to turn away from you. Literally, I want to turn my gaze away from you I want to turn my head down. I will hunch my shoulders over. I will become quiet. My heart rate will tend to drop. My blood pressure will tend to drop. Now by this, I don't mean it goes through the floor and you pass out, but I mean everything tends to slow down and we tend to become less physically active. Uh, the most common form that we see of something like this would be when a dog cowers. And so we see that these kinds of phenomena first is a physiologic form of experience. And this is accompanied, of course, by, a, by an emotional state. It's really difficult to get words around, but if we were to put words to it, we would say, I feel bad. Like there's something wrong with me. I didn't just do something wrong. I am wrong. I didn't just do something bad. I am bad. I'm not enough. I'm not worth anything. I am fill in the blank, a loser. I'm this, I'm that. All these words that we use to actually make sense of and come up with a story that describes just how awful this feeling tends to be for us. And one of the problems with this from a neurobiology standpoint, from a brain, you know, neuron standpoint, is that the particular kinds of neurons that this event run on, that the rails that they run on are the kind of neurons we call them non-myelinated. What that means is basically they're the kind of neurons that don't have a lot of protein wrapped around. And what's important about that is that those non-myelinated neurons, once they fire, and they're firing, it's difficult to get them turned around. It's difficult to get them turned off myelinated neurons, ones that have thick protein sheaths around them, they're actually a lot more flexible. We have a thing in the brain called a social engagement system. You're born with it, but then at the time of birth, that is very immature and has to be exercised by your interaction with your parents. When you interact in a healthy, securely attached relationship with your parents, that social engagement social engagement system gets thickened, it gets activated, it gets strengthened, 
And because it's myelinated, here's what happens. I can have all kinds of feelings, even unpleasant ones with people. You can get mad at me. And we can turn those feelings on and then we can turn them off. They're like a rheostat. I can fly, you can be mad at me, but then we work it out and then we're done and we're okay. Shame does not operate on those kinds of rails. It operates on those kinds of neurons that once they're activated, they stick around for a long time. So you have an event, you do something, you feel ashamed about it. You go to your friend, you tell them about it, and they say, we're good, we're fine, you're forgiven. And you believe them, and you believe they believe themselves, and you feel good for a little while. And the next day you wake up and you think about what you did, and you feel bad again. Because that, that neurophysiologic feeling is still sticking around because of the nature of how our brain operates. So that's what it does physiologically. And what it leads to then is this kind of disintegrating, this disconnected pattern in my brain, like my thinking gets separated from my feeling, and I get separated from you. Mostly it is what we call a disintegrating emotional response. I don't think very well, I don't think very creatively, I don't want to move, and I don't want to come close to you. I don't want to look at you, I don't want you to look at me, because the moment that you do, I'm gonna sense this all over again. And so that's, that's a fundamental kind of way of thinking about it. There are other, other additional things we could talk about about that, but I think for right now, that's really the fundamental thing. And here's the thing, this process begins as early as 15 months of age long before we have language, long before there's any sense of like, I understand why you said that and why I feel bad. No, by the time I'm 15, 18, 24 months of age, I'm already somehow having to find a way to address this, to respond to this as a toddler in my house. And by the time I'm three, four, five, eight, nine, ten 10 years of age, I've already long been practicing a narrative in which I'm trying to make sense of all these things that I'm feeling. Wow. You know, you, you just helped me understand why it is that I can think back to things that happened 25 years ago, 30 years ago, that, that when they come to mind, I have a physiological response uh, similar to, if not identical to, what I felt in that moment, you know, you can't go, oh, ooh, yeah. God, oh, God, I remember that. Oh, I remember yeah. when I said that. Oh, I remember when I did that or when someone did this to me. And, and you know, it just, it doesn't go away. It just moves beyond the fence line of my awareness until I recall it, right? That's right, yeah. Because uh, we've been so, at it for such a long time. We've been yes. practicing it since we were, you know, pre-verbal. Right, okay, so there's the physiological dimension of, 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 of how shame works, right? Yeah. Now yeah. let's just talk for a moment from your perspective about the spiritual roots of shame. Well, again, I'm, I'm somebody who, um, you know, when I think about spiritual formation, when I think about who we are as spiritual beings, that's never really separate from who we are physiologically. And so what's happening in our spiritual realm is running in lockstep with this neurophysiology that we just mm. described. I think that, at least for me, um, I, I'm struck by the fact that shame is named in the second chapter of Genesis. It's early in the creation texts. And for me, what this does is it opens a window to recognize that this is really something that's early in the game, early in the developmental game. So even with what's taking place in the garden, we are warned that it's coming. We're told about it. And I think that, you know, we read about the man and woman being naked and unashamed. You know, right? The text could have said they were naked and happy. They were naked and unafraid. There were a lot of words that the Hebrews could have used. They used this word, I think, to prime us for what was coming. I think it's fair to say that there are a few places in the Bible where shame and sin are not written about kind of hand in glove. When we talk about sin, we talk about shame. It's a common thing. When we talk about Good Friday, when we talk about the crucifixion, we talk about being forgiven of sin and having shame washed away. We talk about these things just like it's a gate, like left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. And my sense is uh, that shame 
is kind of the emotional coding of what sin amounts to. It's the emotional element that sin is kind of like dressed up in when we think about it. And that it comes functionally primarily, you know, I, I, I suggest in, in, in the book that I wrote on shame, I invite the reader to consider that shame was actually in play before the woman eats any fruit in the Garden of Eden. That this conversation that the snake is having with her necessarily it appears that it's just a you know just the two of them. I don't. Adam is a, presumably present, but he's not contributing. There's only two people in the conversation, and this is of course one of shame's primary ways of operating. That it's isolating. And when I'm alone in my own head, that's when shame is banging around as hard as anything. When I'm talking to somebody else about it, if I've got other people who are willing to come and find me, my shame doesn't have nearly as much power over me as it does when it's isolated in my own mind. That conversation, to me, reflects the serpent's intention to isolate the woman, just like I get isolated within my own head, and to cut her off. The snake doesn't say, hey, I don't think you're going to die. Let's go have a conversation with God. Let's get everybody involved in this conversation. He doesn't say that. No, there is an intentionality about saying essentially to her, look, God doesn't really want you to play with his toys because at the end of the day, you're not really as important to him as you think you are, are you? Because if you, right, we, we, and, and, and the writing of the text is brilliant, right? Because it doesn't show everything. It doesn't tell everything. It just shows us the basic stuff and lets us draw conclusions, just like the woman is left to draw conclusions, just like when I'm growing up in a house where I bring my 92%, you know, test to my dad as a 10-year-old, and he says, well, where's the other 8%? You know, like, what the heck? You know, and look, he's, he's not slapping me with his belt. He's not in a drunken stupor. It's not awful. That's relatively benign. But I draw conclusions from this. And if you were to have interviewed dad later, he would have said, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to like encourage him. I'm just trying to help him like work harder. I want, I want him to be the best he can be because I know he's really smart. And I'm thinking like, well, you got to find better ways to help me be smarter. Because <laughs> this, like, this, this, and, and this is the thing where it's so subtle. Shame is powerful because it is so subtle. It is so silent. If we were so good at getting rid of it, we would have taken care of it a long time ago. And so spiritually, I think that shame becomes one of evil's most effective weapons because it really hammers home this idea that we aren't enough, we won't ever be enough, and the idea that that's banging around in my head is not something that I'm going to tell you because, of course, if I'm a Christian, I don't want you to know that I think these things about myself because that would be shaming to me. And so on and on, it just tends to double down on its effect. And this is what we see neurobiologically. This is what we see in our relationships. If there's, you know, if I don't, if I'm ashamed of something that I don't tell you after one day, then I don't tell you after five days, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And we see that this runs the gamut, right? First, they just clothe themselves, the man and the woman, right? And then they hide in the woods. And then you've got their sons, you know, like, you know, killing one another. And then we've got the Tower of Babel and we're off to the races. Wow. Mm. That, that's, that's really a, a wonderful parsing of, of, of it. And I know if we had hours that you could, and, and this is why I recommend the soul of shame to everybody, uh, you could unpack the incredible, negative influence of shame on the human person in their lives. And, and we're going to get to this by the end of the show, which is um, to talk about, uh, well, how do we deal, if I can use that word, neutralize, deal with, address shame uh, in, in, our, in our own lives. But now I just want to jump to the Enneagram. Um, hmm. Uh, We had a a little bit of a conversation uh, earlier today, uh, and you said to me, you gave me your take on the Enneagram, and you said that it's nine helpful ways in which people develop their narratives, right? Um, Talk to me a little bit about that, and and then we'll jump into how that relates to shame. Yeah. Well, 
Um, you know, one of the things we, we talk about in, in psychiatry is this uh, notion about, you know, that we, we believe that pre- people have personalities, right? And there are certain personality styles and types. And there are all kinds of instruments out there that are alleged to tell you what your personality is and what your style is and so forth. The challenge with that, of course, is that the, although these, all these instruments are internally uh, reliable, right? We'd say reliability and, and validity in science they're reliable in that they measure the same things over and over and over again. Um, none of them are actually valid. And by valid, I don't mean that they're not helpful, that they're not useful, or that they're not telling us anything at all. They are. But we know that there isn't really any such thing as personality that we could like put in a lab, that we can put in an x-ray machine, that we could say what that is. And so we have lots of these instruments that combine attachment processes with temperament And these attachment and temperament processes tend to then come into these common tributaries that come into a river that we would say, like, this is the way that we understand who we are. And the Enneagram, I think, is a really uh, helpful, especially when it's, I think, taught helpfully and appropriately and and in in an accessible way, is really helpful in our understanding what is the nature of who I am in terms of my attachment processes combined with my temperament. And I think that where, um, where we then have these nine different forms, they really provide nine uh, consistent, I think fairly predictable ways of people uh, understanding and telling their narrative, tell, understanding how do I operate in the world in response to fundamental things that they sense, image, feel, and think that comes to them quite naturally neurobiologically, like genetically out of the womb, and how that has been shaped, for instance, in their family of origin, in the, in the you know, places that they've, that they've grown up. And so we have these nine different forms of how I am, and I, I'm going to be, I'm, you know, significantly probably one of those forms is the dominant way that I make sense of my life. And that, that's how I understand it. And, and I find it to be a really useful way of doing that. Now, one of the things, I, here's a question for you. We have nine types. And um, I would imagine not all of us experience what you're describing about shame the same way. Mm-hmm. Or we're not all triggered by the same experiences, right, that create shame. And I, mm-hmm. starting with mm-hmm. the heart triad, we spoke a little bit, again, about this earlier. The heart triad is sometimes called the shame triad. And you, you just, we were, you were just actually referring to this idea that perhaps these three numbers are more susceptible to an experience of shame than the other six. Is that, is mm-hmm. that fair to say? I think that is fair to say. I, I think, you know, one of the things that we talk about from a temperament development standpoint is that children tend to come into the world generally more or less comfortable encountering novel stimuli. We have words like extroversion and introversion to kind of try to name that. They're not, they're not very effective when it comes to this. What we mean, though, is that a child tends to be more sensitized to external novel stimuli and children will either tend to be more willing to just jump right in, or they're going to tend to be a little more pensive, a little more observant before they jump in. And there is a range of this, right? It's not black and white. There's a range of this. But we do know that children who tend to be more active right away tend to be a little more left hemispherically dominant in the hemisphere overall electrical activity compared to those who are a little more shy tend to be a little more right hemispherically dominant. This is not a good or a bad thing. These are just measurements, right? These are just observations, but it is to say that we do tend to have these differences. And so we will tend to be sensitized to aware of respond to different relational and emotional qualities differently. So I I work, for instance, with a, uh, I I have a clinical director in our practice, her name is Courtney, and she's just amazing. I mean, she's just amazing. And um, and one of the reasons that I think that we work so well together, we do a lot of work together with groups, is, you know, I'm a guy that tolerates, I'm 
with the emotional state of sadness, I can drink sadness all day long. <laughs> because you're a four. <laughs> <laughs> anger, anger, I don't want to be within a country mile of anger. Yes. Courtney, Courtney, Courtney invites anger over to dinner every night. <laughs> <laughs> she's like so comfortable with anger. Like, I, like even when I'm like, if she's been angry with me or I'm angry with her or whatever, like if I'm ever angry with her, I'm like, a, I'm like, I'm afraid to tell her that I'm angry. And she has no problem telling me that she's angry about things. And of course, I'm thinking there's something wrong with this woman because like, how, like who, who in their right mind would be comfortable? But this is, this is something that I'm talking about. I think that we have different temperamental comfort levels with these different affects. It doesn't mean that I don't ever get angry or that she's never ashamed. It does have to do though, I think, with ways in which our attachment patterns do shape our and work with our temperament in such a way that we tend to come out being more sensitized to one of these three big triad um, emotional states, more so for some than for others. Right, and those three would be anger, mm -hmm. fear, and shame. Are those the mm -hmm. three that you're talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is fantastic. Um, <laughs> because obviously this is how the Enneagram is set up, right? We have eight nines and ones in the anger triad. Uh, there, maybe we could talk about them as anger management systems, you know, uh, and then fear management systems and five, sixes and sevens, right? Mm -hmm. And then twos, threes and fours, uh, we're talking about in that heart triad that, you know, so they're, Eight, nines, and ones would be more sensitized to anger at so, in some way, right? Mm -hmm. And there, there are mm -hmm. strategies for dealing with anger, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we could go around the Enneagram and talk about fear and shame, and, and we would uh, be having, you know, analogous kinds of relationships to their particular uh, fear or, you know, um, uh, shame or anger. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about twos, threes, and fours. All right, okay. so <laughs> twos, the helpers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these are people who um, have a need to be needed and uh, to uh, win the approval of others. Uh, they, their strategy is to meet the needs of others while at the same time disowning their own personal needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and while expecting others to meet their needs without their having to directly come out and ask for those needs to be met. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, and what triggers shame, I think, for a two, and this is the terror behind it, is what if I ask for someone to meet my needs and they tell me no? Mm -hmm. What will that evoke? Yeah. Well, I think, shame, again, right? yeah, yeah. And I think again, the sen back to our the, the, our you know, opening question about what it actually is, uh, it evokes that. And before it it rises to the level of what it means, like I'm not enough or whatever, it's a feeling, right? Mm -hmm. It is this embodied, emotionally uh, mediated experience that I I'm really working hard to avoid. Yes, and I think that's so important for people to realize, and you, you're the one who introduced me to this idea. The, one of the reasons we're so afraid of shame is it feels so bad in our body. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right? I mean, well, that's where, we, that's where anything feels bad. Anything and everything that we feel, we feel it in our body. If, mm -hmm. we, don't, if we don't have access to our body, we don't really feel anything. It doesn't, because yeah. everything's mediated in some way, shape, or form. And I tell people, this is kind of like the emotional equivalent of being nauseous all the time, but not ever being allowed to throw up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, have, do you, know, you of course know, and I, I hope most of our listeners do, that, in, that disturbing um, photo of Lee Harvey Oswald being shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see him, this look on his face, he, he's going inward and he's pulling back and he's got this terrible look on his face. And I tell people all the time, that's what shame feels like to me. Mm -hmm. That, that mm -hmm. picture mm -hmm. of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. of course we're, we're afraid of that, that, that feeling. So I think for twos, shame arises um, in this uh, space where what if uh, someone refuses 
or diminishes the importance of my needs. Therefore, I have to ask for them to be met indirectly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So that's the goal. That's almost like the bypass. How can I get around shame? I'll ask for my needs to be met indirectly. Right. 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 It avoids the possibility of going there. Yes. Or at least, or at least, try, or at least tries to. But here's, you know, here's what the interesting thing, King, interesting thing, Ian. When we do that, like when twos are doing that, uh, with, when they're not being direct, what this is one of the other really striking phenomenon about shame is that the things that we do to cope with it necessarily reinforce it. Yes. Mm. Across the board. Across the board. That's right. Because you say that it's necessary for us to feel the shame to get to our healing, right? We have to confront the, to confront the shame requires that we feel the shame on the way to our healing. And these are ways to repress that. Yeah. Which is why, and maybe we'll get to this, which is why it's healing necessarily requires somebody else to be in the room. Mm. Somebody has to come find me. I can't do this on my own. Mm. Ah, and this we're going to get why, to that at the very okay. end. That's going to be yeah, so yeah. fantastic. Um, <laughs> so this, I think what I did is I kind of wrote a list out about what, what might provoke shame in each of the, uh, uh, in each of the types, right? And uh, how, and then we can have a conversation around uh, maybe how they can be addressed, right? So I think for ones, among the many things that they might, might provoke shame it is that of making mistakes. Mm-hmm. That the the feeling that I've made a mistake creates a great deal of shame for the one, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the two, I've already mentioned, right? It's uh, the refusal on the part of someone else to meet their needs, which leads to this terrible feeling of shame, like, oh, I'm too needy. I keep asking people for too much. You know, that, that mm-hmm. response, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. For the three, yes. it's really the fear of failure because really success is a strategy maybe to um, uh, overcome shame, right? And, and so the fear of failure, fair, failure for a three creates a tremendous amount of shame. I mean, I, don't, yeah. I mean, in many ways, I would argue that the, the most shame, I could say, the, the, the number on the Enneagram that most struggles with shame and in some ways is most out of touch with shame at times is the three, the achiever. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because yeah, we're just, just going to work harder. We're just going to work harder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're just going to work harder, which by the way, can create more shame because in the process you are ignoring your family, your health, your, you know, and there's never enough and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. For the, for the four, um, I think, um, the shame is created by that sense of, uh, your unredeemable deficiency at mm-hmm. the core. Oh yeah. It's, that's me. That, That's yeah. me, man. Yeah. And, and so maybe, actually, I'm going to change my mind. I, I, maybe okay. fours, fours are the, the number that is most attuned to shame. And um, because it is about, uh, I haven't done something wrong. I, I, I am fundamentally, at my core, uh, flawed, wrong, disfigured. Uh, there's something perhaps even monster-like uh, about, about who I am at my core that has to be hidden. And, and as I understand it, I mean, shame has this component in it, which is the fear of exposure, right? Well, like, I, yeah, we, I think, and I would, I, again, from a spiritual formation standpoint, I would probably um, extend that a little further and to say the exposure is part of it, but it is, exposure is really still just, a harbinger, right? It, it's a harbinger that like, once I'm exposed, you're going to leave. Right. Mm. You see me and then you go. And it is, and it's not just that I am alone. It is in the going away. It is in my seeing you seeing me while you leave. And you know what it's like for me that you're leaving and you're going to go anyway. Oh, I mean, that yeah. just, just you describing the experience makes my heart ache. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically somebody looking at you leaving and saying like like I'm I screw you and I'm enjoying going. And this is, I think, in some respects, to me, this gets to the heart of this comment. You know, it's not good for man to be alone. You know, he didn't have to say that in Genesis two, right? The writer of the script doesn't. Have, 
God could have just said, hey, I want to make it, I want to make a, I want to make somebody for Adam. Look around, so like seeing all these animals two by two by two. I, I don't know, Adam, let's but somebody says, goes out of their way to say, it's not good. And I think that that kind of anthropological comment, like that fundamental comment in the creation text says something very, very uh, big. That this whole sense of, of departure. You know, it's not like I'm lost in the grocery store and my mom doesn't know that I'm lost. It's somebody knows exactly where I am and they're not coming. Mm. Mm. Oh, man. And, and just as you're saying that, what is making me, my mind is spinning in a million directions. But in a way, I suppose what we could say is that the strategies of each of these types is a way to ensure that that experience won't happen. But of course, what it does is actually <laughs> make it happen. Mm -hmm. mm. Because, right? I mean, a two that smothers people with love thinking this will not, this will ensure that you won't abandon me. Actually the smothering leads to abandonment. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So the yes. three becomes a success. And then when, uh, and they're thinking, I, if I fail, I will be abandoned. Mm -hmm. But eventually, and it's a little tougher with threes, but oftentimes in midlife threes hit some kind of a wall of failure or of just ennui you know that feeling mm. of is this all there is mm. and but often man when you meet a three that has failed at something mm. Mm. uh moral failure professional mm. failure whatever whatever it might be but it's it's heartbreaking because the the, the strategy the story of their life has broken apart mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and and oftentimes you know uh the things we do to win the love of others actually creates more distance. So if you think about it, yeah. the more successful, or, or I'm, going, I'm going to now commit verb aside, but you, <laughs> the more pedestalized you are, the higher you are on a pedestal of success, the further yeah. away you are from everybody else, while you thought to yourself, no, the more successful I am, the closer I'm going to be to people. And it has right. just the opposite effect. Yep. Yeah. Right. So we've talked yeah. about fours and, and that, that feeling of the fatal flaw, their fear of abandonment. Uh, I think for fives, the investigators, that one of the things that can create shame for them is um, not having the right answers. Mm. It's mm. This, in, this ineptitude mm. and inadequacy that drives the, the, the lust for knowledge and information, mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. that if I just know enough, mm -hmm. I won't be found out. Right. Well, I don't know. If, I don't know what you, you know, when we were in the uh, workshop that you did uh, and we were kind of, everybody was trying to give some assessment about where we thought we were and so forth. And I think I, I came out of that um, with some sense that I'm a four with a five wing. That's what yes. I was described as. And I can tell you that probably until I was in my early forties, I would go to medical conferences, and you, you get this with physicians, almost like many physicians. I would go to medical conferences, and I was sure that I am the dullest pencil in the box. <laughs> I, I am sure that I do not know enough. Like, how, how did that guy on the stage get to know so much? Like, I don't, I don't know enough. I will never know enough. I'm not smart enough. I, I, I just have to work hard. But there is a sense in which if I don't have the right answer, you know, there is a part of me that feels like I, I don't even want to be in the conversation if I can't know that I don't have the right answers all the time. Right. Because it would cause shame. Right? Yeah. You, Yo, you yeah. found out. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. So then when we get to sixes, I actually asked uh, my daughter's uh, fiance this morning, you know, like, you're a six. Tell me what, what is it that provokes shame for you? And uh, she said that it's the second guessing that follows my having been in a conflict with somebody. Uh, mm. So, mm. so afterwards I have this sense of shame. Should I have, did I mm. say the right thing? You know what I mean? What, whatever mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. that there mm -hmm. is some, there is some kind of shame response that comes up in, in her when she feels like, you know, did I do it right? Mm -hmm. Did I, mm -hmm. did I do it wrong? Mm -hmm. And then there's this, this vacillation, you know, back and forth. Uh, and of course we know that the, the, 
the major issue for sixes is fear and security. You know, mm -hmm. it's like they have a, a, a need for safety and security in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, fear management, right? Um, and jump in, by the way, anywhere along the line here as I go through yeah, these. Yeah, no, this, this, that, this is great. I mean, I, I, I will say this. I, as, you're, as you're speaking, you're describing these, uh, you have, you know, are, we're, we're using, we're emphasizing different things. Mm -hmm. um, that di you know, the different uh, uh, numbers have the different category and the different triads. Also, groups of triads have. I, I am, I'm, my mind is continually uh, returning to ways in which, like, I would be curious about the attachment processes, where in which any of these folks, you know, grow up in particular homes, they come out with certain temperaments, and you know, so for instance, you know, you take me a four you put me in some different family to be reared and would I have been, I have, ha, would, would, would my um, sensitivity to shame had, had fallen along different lines. Mm -hmm. And because there, there are plenty of ways in which I could see in my own family, how my temperament mixed with my parents own practices with me kind of led to some of the stuff that, that I am like I, there's, it's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that stuff out. And so I, I think it's really, again, it, it's, it's one, as you're going through these, I'm thinking, oh, this is another helpful way, another helpful tool for people to have as they um, uh, reflect on and are curious about their attachment processes as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, let's just, let's just back up for a second. Oftentimes, twos grow up in families where um, uh, one member of the family is usually a parent or a caretaker is particularly needy mm -hmm. and and uh they become mommy or daddy's little girl uh you know maybe dad doesn't have a great relationship with mom you know mm -hmm. he, he he attaches to the daughter in in some sort of you know emotionally incestuous way mm -hmm. uh she becomes daddy's good little girl or she becomes the you know she gets a lot of strokes for being the kid that's always the helper mm -hmm. always the mm -hmm. kind kid Right. Mm -hmm. For threes, I always tell people, forgive me people for, for repeating myself, it's the Andre Agassi thing. It's a, a father who did not allow him to have his own identity and feelings. In the words of Andre Agassi, my father could not tell the difference between his love for tennis and his love for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's not allowed to become the person he wants to be. He's got to become the person his father wants him to be. Right. And so, and so becomes the achiever who has to win. Why? To win the trophy? No, dad's love, yeah. right? Yeah, boy. Uh, for yeah. for me as a four, I could go. They, everyone who listens is is tired of my old story, but I, but I I can certainly see growing up with an alcoholic father uh, with a very sensitive sort of artistic sort of bent, where um, there was really no connection made, no mm -hmm. connection made, and I, I I it launched me on a quest. Uh, to find whatever that, that missing piece was that led to father's rejection. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I grew up in a family where uh, I was, I was the uh, two stories. One, either I'm the fourth of four sons. That's one story. Uh, the second story is I'm the firstborn of a second generation of a second family. My brothers were 18, 16, and 11 years older than me, and my parents were 45 when I came along. And so I had a very different kind of rearing, but I was still with a dad, uh, both parents of who, who, I, who I have great confidence loved me. I don't, I don't have any question about that. But I, you know, my, my father, um, deeply affectionate, but also very clear that you didn't want to piss him off. And so, A, uh, you, you kind of walked around without anybody ever saying this, you walked around uh, being afraid of being angry, being afraid that you, because you don't, because like, you don't know what's going to happen. And of course, he was not an angry guy. And, you know, later you discover, oh, the reason he wasn't is because everybody's working really hard to make sure they don't make him angry. Now, you don't know that at the time as a kid, right? right? Because, and he wasn't, but he was like, had that kind of a stern posture about certain things, deeply generous, deeply kind, but like, don't cross the line. And the other thing was, I, you know, looking back, the one thing uh, I really would have longed for, I, I you know, he and I never had a, a single conversation that he initiated about my inner life. 
which is where I was spending 95% of my time by the time I was right. 12. Uh huh. And on the other hand, I have a mom who deeply, in both these people, deeply committed to Jesus, deeply, deeply committed believers. But I had a mom who probably at some level was probably uh, more emotionally attached to me than she was to my dad, especially um, at the interface of spiritual experience. And uh, I probably ended up, uh, you know, working really hard to kind of help regulate her anxiety about lots of things that often got expressed in spiritual language and this and that and so forth and so on. And so I was a kid who was like, I discovered like, oh, I'm working really hard in life not to make people angry. And what do you know? I work with a colleague who I love like my own, you know, sister who is quite comfortable with angry, with anger. I, I make sure I don't make people angry and I don't make people anxious because like, it's just too much for me to then have to like, I got to regulate that stuff. You know, um, uh, it's, it's a striking thing to discover. And, and like some of this stuff I'm, I've only discovered like in the last seven years, I'm 57 and I'm like, what the heck? Why didn't I, you know, why didn't this, why didn't I figure this stuff out when I was 17 instead of 57? So anyway. Well, this is fantastic because, you know, as we go on, you know, fives, many of the fives that I know will tell you that they had, you know, I guess it's a Jungian term, uh, a, uh, an experience of overwhelmment mm -hmm. or engulfment. Mm -hmm. And so in response um, by their, from caregivers, right, they retreated up into the back of the mind as mm -hmm. a way to say, I, this is, I'm psychologically too crowded. I have to find a place where I can hide and not where you can't get to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm. I remember, I mean, I, um, gosh, I, I, I remember, so my father died when I was 17 and I remember, um, you know, fam, everybody came in, we, they were there for a week and the day that the last person left, the moment the last person left, the front door closed and I can still see where I was and where my mom, so it's just me and my mom. And God bless her, God rest her soul. I remember thinking to myself in that moment, I am trapped in a vault with my mom. Now, again, she wouldn't have known this. She wouldn't, I mean, she was, she was a uh, deeply uh, earnest, God follower. And if she had known then what was going on, I mean, if, if she would really been awake to it, you know, she, I, I think she would have done everything she could have done to have worked on that. But, you know, she wasn't aware, just like my dad wasn't aware. And um, so we work on things as we are able to. And I, I can say this, that, uh, you know, some of that attachment to me really came out later as I, you know, I started, I went to college, dated girls, and every time I would date a girl, everything was fine until things start to get a little serious, and then my relationship with my mom would start to get, you know, weird. Mm. And eventually, when it came to the woman that I'm now married to for 33 and a half years, it got really, like, off the rails. My mom's distress about whether or not my wife was a believer and whether or not she was serious about that and so forth and so on. And, you know, like it, we, we had some, and, but she was willing to grow through that because we talked about those kinds of things, but there in that, that sense of being overwhelmed and me retreating back up into my head, like what Pfizer, you know, to your point. Yeah. So, you know, then when we, we talk about sixes, their need for security and safety, they often grow up in homes where things are very unpredictable. You know, you, mm -hmm. you might have a, 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 a rageaholic parent, let's say, you just don't know when things are going to go sideways on you. And of course, you know, as you mentioned earlier, some of these, what we're descriptive describing here are temperaments or dispositions, yeah. but, but they're also, there, there's a little bit of trauma basis here, right? So you, of course. you, you, what happens is, is this kid learns, I've just got to be hypervigilant all the time. I have to right. get ready for the worst all the time. Right? right. And then I'll be safe and secure in the world. I'll be prepared yeah. when, when it happens, right? 
I won't be caught off guard. You know, I think for sevens, I asked my son this morning, um, and he said uh, that it's always very frightening for him when, or what causes shame for him is when someone outwits him. Hmm. Which mm. is a very 70 sort of a thing, wow. you know. Mm. Oh. Uh, they're so quick minded and so, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're just quick witted people, you know, they can just mm -hmm. on a dime talk, you know, and, and make a point that is yeah. hard to refute, you know. Yeah, they drive me crazy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. fours and sevens can have a little yeah. bit of. Time. They have very different ways of seeing the world. Yes. Um, you know, for eights, this need to assert power and strength over the environment and other people in, uh, and in order to, sh to hide vulnerability and weakness, right? Mm -hmm. this, this, this fear of betrayal mm -hmm. uh, and of abandonment um, mm -hmm. that is underneath all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. nines, uh, uh, of course, is, I mean, I asked Annie, who's a nine, I said, when do, when do you feel ashamed? And she said, when I haven't been honest and told someone the truth because I was afraid of asserting myself. Mm. 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 So I think for mm. every type, you know, there are these mm. shame triggers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and if we can learn our shame trigger, mm -hmm. right, yeah. it's not necessarily going to, mitigate or eliminate shame but that that self-knowledge can lead to a degree of self-compassion mm -hmm. which is i'm sure part of the journey of uh moving into a better relationship if i can call it that with the experience of shame right it can it can somehow or another the beginning of that self-knowledge which leads to self-compassion this is triggering me from something that happened 40 years ago or 30 years ago. It has now released all this physio neurophysiological stuff. And, um, and so I'm, I'm going to be kind to myself in this moment, realizing that this is, this is what's happening. You know, um, people have sometimes asked me, well, so wait, Kurt, is there, is, is there ever any, is there ever a time when shame is good? And, you know, my response to that is that shame, it appears that shame was, uh, if, if we buy in principle the, the, the biblical narrative of kind of who we are as people, it would appear that shame was built into the fabric of the creation. Um, and, you know, it's like our emotional inflammatory response to turning away from each other. And... Uh, the question is not, is it good or is it bad? The question is always, what do I do in response to it? Mm -hmm. um, I'm reminded of St. Paul's words in 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, I think it's the 10th verse, where he says, there is a godly grief that leads to repentance, and there is an ungodly grief that leads to death. And I think that that verse really is helpful for me in considering what we do in response to shame. Frankly, there are things such that if I were to do them and shame is what I feel, I should feel it. The question is what I do in response to that. If repentance is my action, and I would suggest again that repentance always comes in response to the presence of another. I don't repent on my own. I repent because somebody comes to find me and says, hey, could you come please follow me? Come come this way. And at some level, if I repent, I'm going to say, gosh, this shame is real because it's associated with a real thing that I've done. And I'm going to turn around and go a different direction. And that turning around includes that I'm going to assess the shame for what it is as a signal. That's its purpose. Its, its purpose is to send a signal to me that, that abandonment is on the way if I continue on this path. Being left is on the way. And unfortunately, what happens for so many of us, I end up being alone in my response to it, and my isolated responses only further strengthen the shame response and down the rabbit hole I go. Mm -hmm. 
the, the the ungodly response that Paul talks about, I think, that leads to death. I think like, yeah, no kidding, because it leads me away from you. It leads me away from myself. It leads me into disconnected places. Mm -hmm. So the things that we're talking about when we pause, we're not just pausing, I would say, for self-compassion as part of it, but this is, we hinted at this earlier, that the healing for shame necessarily requires the, uh, the presence of other people coming to find me. This is why we would say that the, the, this whole notion that Good Friday is God coming to find us. And with Jesus stripped naked, beaten to a pulp, hung on a tree right in front of us, God is saying, there's no place in your shame that I am not already there waiting for you. Mm. And I'm going to wait for you to open your eyes to me being with you in that space and let resurrection take us both home. Mm. And um, this notion that when I'm in my worst places of shame, the, the, the reality is like, I don't have really much of what it takes for self-compassion. And so what I got to do is I do have to call, literally in my mind, I have to call on the people who are in my life, the two guys that I meet with every Tuesday morning for confession and prayer, the other, the other you know, people that, like, by whom I'm deeply known, who, I'm, who I know, th like, it's, it's their images, it's their voices, it's them that have to, like, I have to wake up to again to turn my attention, literally, my neural networks, turning my attention away from where shame has wanted to take me and reactivate that, turning it toward what it means for me to be loved and cared for. And to me, this is, this is all about Trinitarian theology. This is about the notion that Jesus, even when he goes to the cross, he does not go by himself. And uh, that no matter what number we are, uh, and no matter how intensely or sensitized we are to this, that we desperately need other people to come to find us when we're in trouble with it. Okay, this is so powerful. I, I don't, yeah, uh, this is so powerful because I think one of the things that I want people to hear is, and there's a lot of ways to approach the Enneagram. It has, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a, just layers and layers and layers of ways of approaching it and thinking about it. But our strategies, our unconscious motivations, our ways in our mind that will help us um, escape the possibility of abandonment mm. uh, and to which is goes hand in hand with shame. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. If yes. I if I don't, you know, if, if I don't make a mistake, you won't leave me. If I meet right. all your needs, mm -hmm. you won't leave me. If I'm successful, you won't leave me. If I'm special and unique, you won't leave me. Uh, you know, if I'm smart and I have all the answers, you won't leave me. If I'm prepared for what the worst is, I can, you know, and so forth and so on. We can go, we can go all the way yeah. down the line. Yeah. Yeah. And so I love this conversation because what we're connecting it to here is this idea that these aren't just fear, anger, and, um, you know, uh, um, shame, you know, shame, man, th these are all shame management systems. Mm, yes. It right? would appear that way. Yeah. Yes. And so um, it, it seems to me that if we can uh, recognize that the very thing, the very strategy that we are employing to avoid shame ultimately leads to it. Yep. Yep. It ultimately leads to abandonment. If, you know, the seven who's always funny and, you know, blah, 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 and is always looking into the future somehow, you know, eventually a lot of the behaviors of the seven will um, lead people to leave them. <laughs> you, 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 do you know what I'm saying? And, and, and sometimes yes. the, bu the yeah. bullying eight who mm -hmm. thinks, you know, if I'm just, what happens? You end up ashamed and alone, yeah. right? Yeah. So let's, let's, I want, we, we could go on forever about this. Um, and, I, and I wish we could, but I want to just end up by talking a little bit about human community and the healing of shame. Mm -hmm. um, as, as you know, uh, from our friendship of the last five or six, well, three and a half, actually, it's been more than three and a half years. I think it was five years probably now that we first met. 
mm-hmm. that I've been in a 12 step recovery program for drug and alcohol addiction. Mm-hmm. And in many ways, what happens in that room is uh, people come in with the most shameful stories. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember Anthony, I don't know if I've ever told this story on the show, perhaps I have, but we, there was an experience we had, we have, these things called speaker meetings where a person stands up in front of the room and tells their story. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some stuff comes out that would make your eyes roll into the back of your head. But of course, everyone else in the room has done the exact same stuff. I mean, you never, it's not like I have never been to an, to a a 12 step recovery meeting and thought to myself, well, now that was new. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, frankly, sin is just not that creative. I mean, it's yeah. fairly repetitive, right? Yeah. And so, but we did have this experience once, this, this poor woman, she'd been in for 30 days. She told a story that was so bad, it brought the room to silence. And because it involved, you know, she was a meth addict and she sold a child and, you know, to get it, to get drugs. I mean, she just did one thing after another that just made you go, oh my gosh. And she, at the end of it, most, most of the time people would clap and say, thank you. And then people would raise their hand and say, Hey, this is how I identify with your story. This is how I did the same thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, but Uh we were all just, just for a moment silent. And, Mm -hmm. um, this poor gal standing in front of a room of 40, 50 people just looking at her. And from the back of the room, there was this old lady. She was, a uh, this was back in, this was in New Canaan, Connecticut. And she was an heiress. And she literally like smoked one cigarette after another. (laughs) She would just come in like, you know, in these beautiful clothes, you know, and, but she was very wise. She had been in the program literally since Bill W founded it. Okay. So she was one of the very first members of this 12 step group. And, uh, this woman got finished. There's dead silence in the room. And from the back of the room, you hear this, the word of the Lord. And all of the liturgically minded people in the room immediately responded, thanks be to God. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, oh you, know, you, you feel this evaporation of the shame. Yep. Yep. Right uh, on. You know, and it was so, and that happens time and time again in those meetings. Yep. And I yep. think this is what you're trying to say, which is, you cannot heal shame in isolation. Isolation can right. only amplify shame. The only way out is if you tell the story right. of, of your, uh, your shame journey, if you will. Right. Yeah. I think we're finding, you know, we run these groups in our practice and everything we're doing in our practice is really uh, kind of moving in that direction because we've seen the pace and the depth with which people find healing and recommissioning, I think, and creativity uh, in the context of these communities in which the intention is for people to tell their stories more and more truly. And of course, you know, they, uh, at, at first they, they imagine that coming into these groups, I'm sure, like much of people who many times people come into recovery groups, I, I like I come with my problem and I'm going to be in the group and the group will help me with my problem. I'll go home and I'll like, you know, apply all the things that I learned here in the group. And then they get to a point where they discover, oh, other people have similar problems and we have we, we feel I like I, I feel akin to them. And so I feel like I'm not quite so alone in going home and working on my problem. But there's still this lingering sense that like it's still me with my isolated shame that I have to go home and do this the right way. I'm trying to get strength here to go out there. And then they'll find that they get to a third phase in these groups where they realize that uh, they're not in the group primarily to work on the problem that they have at home or to work on the problem that they have at work or their depression that lives outside this group. They're in the group to love the group. Mm. they're in the group to be known by the people who are in the group. At first glance, it's easy for people to think, oh, this group here, it's like, it's, it's like they're like, you know, my $50 friends, right? They're like, it's synthetic. I'm, I'm paying for friendship. It's not real. This isn't real life. Real life happens in my church or at my work or in my, you know, the guys I play poker with or whatever. It's... And it almost 
invariably happens that you know people eventually end up saying i i don't have any place in my life where i do what i do in this room there's nobody and, and there are many people who might even know the facts about their story but not in the way that they're known in these places where they routinely do not let shame hide in the shadows mm. and the more that those parts of our lives that are hidden in that shame shadow are where we allow the light to be turned. And by that light, I mean like we're not just telling a story, we're also allowing others to receive it. And we are also practicing receiving other people's stories. In order for me to be a wash in connection, and a wash in connection in the very moment when my brain anticipates that you would most likely want to run out of the room with your hair on fire because of what you heard me say. It's in those moments, right? I mean, this is why, again, why Good Friday just so catches evil off guard. Evil would never have predicted crucifixion as the way home for the creation. And God comes and says, I'm going to crawl into this shame pit with you. And so that you can see me seeing you and you know, like, none of this scares me. None of this embarrasses me. I'm just going to keep coming for you. Hide as you will. I'm just keeping, I'm just going to keep coming. And I'm just, uh, you know, even your invitation to have me here. Uh, you know, we were, uh, we first met at this conference in Florida and I was new to this community there. I didn't know. And I was, you know, I wasn't sure, like I'm some psychiatrist here. Like, what am I supposed to, you know, I'm going to, and I remember I got done with my opening presentation and uh, you made a beeline for where I was sitting in the front row. And um, you very quietly but very assertively said into my ear, what a wonderful job I've done, repeated it. And uh, even in colorful words that I don't to this day forget and won't ever. And I felt like, my gosh, like even there, you just came to find me. And I feel like it's happened even by me being invited here. And so um, uh, this has just been a really wonderful time to be with you. So thanks. Well, thank you. And what a amazing conversation about how shame uh, is part of this human experience uh, for all types and how it is that we can begin to, as a friend of mine likes to say, uh, reverse the momentum of Eden mm. Mm. where, uh, we can find healing. Uh, you know, part of the thing, part of what I oftentimes do at Enneagram conferences is I close them with the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and the reason I do is because we've, we've heard about, we've just spent two days talking about difference mm. you know, ones are different from twos we're different mm. from threes right and different than mm -hmm. fours and what i want them to all understand at the end of the conference is yes but mm. we drink from the same cup we eat from the same loaf uh we are mm. together in this though different uh we are one and uh, thank you so much. I mean, I, every time I talk to you, Kurt, I always leave feeling so um, enriched isn't the right word. I guess the word I would use is number one, I, I feel like I've had an opportunity to bathe in your, the atmosphere that you radiate of accepting other people. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I just feel like I'm a better human being for having spent the time with you. Mm. And uh, mm. so I feel that wow. way today. And wow. I hope that wow. everyone who listens to this podcast will be as blown away as I am by, by its beauty. Mm. So again, thank you. Uh, friends, this is uh, Dr. Kurt Thompson, the author of The Soul of Shame, 
retelling the stories we believe about ourselves. Both Anthony and I have read it uh, and loved it, felt deeply uh, impacted by it. And uh, so I want to make sure that all of you jump on Amazon and grab this book, The Soul of Shame by Kurt Thompson. Kurt, again, blessings, peace. Thank you. We love you. And I'm we're right going to have you back. We're going to have good. you back. And remember, uh, remember, everybody, the words of the great Oscar Wilde, be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Until next time.